This is a continuation of our uh, lectures on Bolivia. Uh, the first, last lecture we did on Bolivia, I was concentrating on the election of Evo Morales, which was coming up and was just held yesterday, as a matter of fact, and uh, he not only survived whatever plots were being plotted against him prior to that, but he won the election by 60% of the vote, uh, about what we anticipated. The uh, now what I'm going to do is to go back and deal with Bolivia as we have with every other of the Latin American countries and to start with the period of primitive communism and move forward. Now, you will recall also that in our lecture on Venezuela, I uh, began that by discussing the origins of domesticated plants and animals in the entire Andean region and therefore cited the Ayacucho sequence which is the anchor archaeological sequence of all of the Central Andes. Now, that's in the Ayacucho Valley of the Central Andes in central Peru. And um, I want to start out by pointing out that, again, we want to go back to that basic concept because of two reasons. First of all, obviously Bolivia is a key part of the Central Andes and it's also part of the core Central Andean culture area, by which I mean all of Bolivia and all of central Peru now that is um, until the until the last century. That is until the 20th century. What we the as far as a person who was an educated intellectual person in uh, any of this uh, South American Andean area was concerned, both Bolivia and Peru were the same thing in terms of culture area, and it had been that way for thousands of years. What we call a Central Andean culture area includes from north to south part of Colombia, all of Ecuador, all of Peru, Bolivia, and northern Chile. And from east to west, it takes in everything from the Pacific Ocean to the western Brazilian Amazon basin. So the core of that central Andean culture area is all of central Peru and all of Bolivia. And in 1981, McNeish and Associates published the prehistory of the Ayacucho Basin, which is now available. And um, we'll have all kinds of maps in it. And in fact, one of the maps that I uh, have in the printed edition of this uh, chapter is uh, taken directly from that. Now, just to recap this a little bit, the very earliest occupation of this culture area, the uh, Central Andean Culture Core area, is around uh, 22,000 years at Piki Machai Cave, which is very near, like a few minutes drive outside of the town of Ayacucho. The um, other thing I want to point out is that this is not the earliest South American appearance of primitive communism or of humans. We have 33,000 year old dates, that is 11,000 years earlier in uh, Chile. And we'll talk about that, those in detail when we get to Chile, but the important thing is that now it's possible that people didn't go all the way up to the highlands of uh, Peru until 22,000 years ago, that it took them 11,000 years to make that trip, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, however, that may turn out to be 22,000 years is a firm beginning date, and uh, from that time forward, we have um, all of the domestic, uh, we begin the process that leads to um, the formation of tribal agriculture, then simple chiefdoms, and finally advanced theocratic chiefdoms in that Central Andean core area. Um, now, a big foreign uh, intervention here in terms of plant domesticates comes in the form of corn. Now, when I was in graduate school, we still thought, we still didn't know what the origin of Andean corn would be. But over the years, we have found that uh, Thanks to the work of a man named Brian Finucane, I guess is how you pronounce it. I hope I haven't mispronounced his name. He was able to demonstrate in uh, not in recent years that the corn that we see in the Ayacucho sequence uh, is genetically identical to that which comes from the Tehuacan sequence in Mexico, and that that means that this cannot be an independent invention. This has to be a result of contact between. Meso uh, between the Tehuacan Valley and the Mesoamerican culture area and the Ayacucho Valley and the Central Andean core area. That happens uh, uh, by about 
let's see, what is the very, early, the very earliest date there? 1800 BC is when uh, this, uh, these first dates, in other words, 2800 years ago, by that time, the uh, corn is established in the Ayacucho sequence. Now, from 1000 BC forward, that is, within 800 years, maize had become the most important single agricultural product that was being produced in, uh, the, in, in the entire central Andean region. Why is that? Well, even though they had potatoes and cassava, uh, prior to that, as far as carbohydrate went, that would be fine, but they just don't, it just doesn't, neither potatoes, potatoes nor cassava have a sufficient amount of protein. Now, to support a large population and all of the energy and effort that's going to be involved in the construction of an advanced theocratic chieftain, a kingdom, and then an empire. So it took them about uh, until about 700 BC for that dependence to become absolute. So in other words, about 1100 years. Um, from 1000 BC forward, that is from about 3000 years ago forward, uh, the population of the central Andean core area explodes largely because maize allowed the introduction of an increasingly intensive irrigation agriculture which had the protein base as well as the carbohydrate as I've just described. And so we have a rapid transformation of tribal agriculturalists into simple chiefdoms and then into advanced theocratic chiefdoms and finally into kingdoms, that is slave-based societies where you have true class differentiation. Now, there are three of those kingdoms that arise in Bolivia, um, which is the part of Bolivia that's right next to the Ayacucho region, features this huge lake, which I'm so sure some of you have seen pictures of, if nothing else, called Lake Titicaca. Around that lake, there are three different kingdoms in different parts of Bolivia. They extend into different parts of what's today Bolivia. Um, that uh, precede the appearance of the first central Andean-wide empire. Now, those, those uh, three kingdoms are called Tiwanaku, Mosho, and Moyos. Um, the first is the, trans is the Tiwanaku Empire, which has its capital at the city-state of Tiwanaku, which is on the southeastern shore of Lake Titicaca, and about 45 miles west of Bolivia's contemporary capital of La Paz. Um, I go over some of the possible connections between contemporary tribes and people of Tiwanaku in the textbook, but it's not that important for purposes of this discussion. Now the second big group of, uh, or the second major kingdom that emerges out of the theocratic chiefdom stage in this area of Bolivia that's next to the Ayacucho Valley is called the Moshos or Mojos or Mozenos or the people that, uh, now if you look at the map you'll see that their capital is was in the area of uh, the Madeira River where it com comes together uh, with the Mamore River and that won't mean much to most of you who have, aren't familiar with the geography of South America but suffice it to say that they have their own uh, uh, very large kingdom, uh, capital city of this kingdom now, the third of these areas is uh, called the Moyos area. Uh, it's a third kingdom. It also had a capital not far from Lake Titicaca at a place called Iskanwaya. And uh, that took about 200, well, from about 1145 to 1445 or 1425, uh, we have a period of several hundred years where the capital city was being constructed. And large parts of that are still uh, still right there for you to take a look at if you go to visit. Um, so we have these three kingdoms that are emerging. What's happened in all of these areas is that the sociocultural highly rated ranks of the advanced the theocratic chiefdoms have finally differentiated themselves so that you have true classes with differential access to the means of production. In other words, the highest ranks in these all three of these kingdoms became classes and they had title deed to ownership of all kinds of things and um, they established the stage of slavery, enslaving a mass of these uh, Indians 
to uh, their rule. Now, I want to. I, I make a few comments about Amazonia's ideology. Uh, there are certain aspects of it which are, um, when you're looking in the anthropological and archaeological literature, you'll see a lot of talk about Amazonian culture. Well, they have certain idea, certain features in common, and while the details of these common features are not really very important in terms of the structure of these kingdoms, they are important in terms of establishing a uh, general mythology which is region-wide. And th this mythology has the idea that there is the, the present-day earth where we all live, then there's the sky above, and um, there is the something below. Now, the general idea of, of ritual from that is if a person is sick, it's because they have done something to alienate the supernatural forces, um, especially those in the lower world. And uh, so then they need the intervention of a priest to um, help them get over their whatever their sickness may be and to uh, search for it in conformity with these this idea of a, a tripartite world that they're in the middle of. Well, we may or may not come back to that, but at least you'll be aware that there are some common ideological features which emerge at that time. Now, there are two empires which emerge and absorb these kingdoms. The first is the empire based out of the city-state of Wari, which is very close to contemporary Ayacucho. And if you've read any of my biographical accounts, you'll know that uh, I started out one of my adventures in South America um, while we were working at Piki Machai Cave, the one with the very old 22,000 year old dates, uh, and which wasn't very far from the ruins of the city, uh, this capital city of the Wari Empire, which is also right there in the Ayacucho Basin. So, and I, I talk about that a little bit, and if you're interested in how I got down there and how I got involved in all of this, uh, that's, that whole story is told in uh, the book, um, uh, third, fourth, and especially the fourth and fifth volumes of my series, Idaho Smith's Search for the Foundation. The fourth book is called uh, uh, Rivers of Blood. And the fifth book is called um, um, High Finance South American Style. Well, at any rate, we'll uh, skip over that, go to the uh, beginning of this uh, the Worry Empire situation, Wari emerged and absorbed these other three kingdoms which had been around Lake Titicaca or someplace in contemporary Bolivia. And the empire stretched as far north as Ecuador and as far south as Chile before it collapsed as a consequence of internal struggles. Now, several hundred years later, the one you've all heard about, the Inca Empire, emerges. That's the second Transandian Empire. And it absorbed, it took into account everything of the first empire and went even farther north into Colombia and further south in Chile and all the way over to the Amazonian basin um, and, and what took large parts of what is today Paraguay and Brazil um, and incorporated them into its own self. Now, the Inca Empire was taken apart by the arrival of the Spaniards and the truth of the matter is that the Spaniards, after they had defeated the uh, a couple hundred Spaniards again, they did exactly the same thing in Peru. They followed the Book of Cortes. Um, they exploited the differences between the subjugated peoples and the central part of the um, and the hierarchy of the Inca. Um, they defeated them again and again, and eventually forced them out, and then divided up the country among themselves. And it stayed that way, pretty much, with a bunch of um, uh, latifundistas, the guys that had conquered it, having divided the country up, enslaved the local population, uh, created self-contained latifundias, and um, that is plantations where everything that you would need in everyday life you would have within that plantation or that latifundia, and mines. Gold mining and silver mining, of course, were the biggest things for obvious reasons. Not much changed, as a matter of fact in Bolivia as far as the masses of people were concerned 
until about the time I arrived there, which is in 1977. <coughs> we will go through the history of all of this Bolivian struggle in the book and in, and in this lecture a little bit uh, that preceded in the century that preceded my arrival, but fundamentally as far as the masses of the peoples in Peru were concerned, none of the changes which occurred before or after the Spanish had a great deal of effect on them. They were slaves before the Spanish took over and they were slaves after the Spanish took over. And they would be until the uh, final liberation of Peru and Bolivia. And even then, they, their situation did not change that much. Um, again, we're talking about the people that do all the work. So, I've talked about how I got up there in 1977 in a book called uh, Shining Path, the Peruvian Revolution which is uh, the third book in my series, Idaho Smith's Search for the Foundation. It's available in printed form in some libraries. If you go to the website called worldcat.com or .org, you will type in my name, you'll find these books and the location in libraries closest to you and the distance to those libraries. Or you could just go to uh, Kindle Books at amazon.com, type in uh, Shining Path, the Peruvian Revolution, or my name, and it'll show you. I have about ten books on sale there, I believe, in ebook form. Okay, now let's skip over that. The, the revolution against Spanish control began with Napoleon's overthrow of the Spanish aristocracy of that time, and uh, there was a corresponding uprising in the city of in the, what's now Sucre, but was then called Chuquisaca, in 1809. You'll recall that this is uh, the days of uh, uh, when war was occurring between uh, Napoleon's forces and the remnant rump Spanish army that he had inherited and when he put his brother on the throne, Joseph Bonaparte, in Madrid. He was immediately opposed in Cadiz and a few far away places by loyal royalist forces who were assisted by the British and you have Sharp's Rifles as a series that's on television. It used to be on Netflix, but I don't think it is anymore. <coughs> the uh, number of people that become important in uh, the, the Civil War in Peru and Bolivia emerge about that time. One of them is uh, a man named Sucre who is um, involved in the final defeat of the Spanish army at Ayacucho. And um, thereafter, he names the Bolivia after uh, Bolivar, and uh, the city of Chuquisaca is named after him. Another interesting thing that you want to remember about this particular period is that uh, we have the return to the southern part of South America, and that is Argentina, of one of the generals that has been taking place, taking part in the fight against the new the Napoleon usurpers in Spain named de San Martin, Jose de San Martin. He's a general, a real general, <coughs> who has uh, been fighting alongside the British with the Spanish loyalists against the, uh, uh, that is, the royalist loyalists against the uh, Napoleonic usurpers in Madrid. When that is over, San Martin comes back to Venezuela, back to Argentina his home country, and there he um, saves what is a uh, dying revolutionary movement and um, very quickly expels the Spanish from Argentina. Now, because one thing he's learned while he's in Spain is that this whole thing about the Spanish monarchy uh, controlling the New World, uh, there's no reason for that anymore. They can't even hold on to their own throne. We have to come here and save them. What, we're going, what I'm going to do when I go home, San Martin is saying to himself, is I'm going to lead the struggle to expel the Spanish from my country once and for all. Well, he does that. And um, when he's back in Argentina, he eventually, we'll, well, we, we're going to get to Chile and Argentina in coming lectures, but he eventually is going to cross the Andes, link up with Bernardo O'Higgins in Chile, and the two of them are going to link up with Bolivar, in um, Guayaquil, and uh, then they're going to grow, drop their plans for expelling the Spanish 
from all of the rest of South America, which they do in 1825. Okay, so we've gotten up that far. Now, in the period between 1825 and 1925, more or less, Bolivia begins to be taken apart by other capitalist countries that surround it. For example, Chilean capitalists took the mining concessions on the Atacama Desert away from Bolivia and in, 18, in the 1879 War of the Pacific, and so Bolivia lost its entire coastal uh, Access, its entire access to the Pacific Ocean, its entire coastal region over there. The next serious loss for the Bolivian ruling class was the uh, Acre River because it had was valuable for wild rubber and uh, most of the Amazon was yielded therefore, the Amazonian portion of Bolivia was yielded to Brazilian capitalists in 1903. And finally, uh, in 1934, the Chaco uh, highlands of what is today Paraguay were seized from Bolivia by a Bol uh, Paraguayan capitalist who wanted that land to graze cattle to sell to the meat canning factories of Argentina. So, by 1934, what's left of Bolivia as a country has been radically reduced in geographical size. It's pretty much down to the core area that it was originally uh, in the days then when we have been talking about the, the rise of the first class of state societies in Argentina, in Bolivia, and Peru. Okay, so that intercapitalist internal dogfighting history of Bolivia began when the first president, Sucre, was forced to resign in 1828, and there had been a steady stream of military bosses. I'm not going to go through that in the lecture. It's in the book, so if you want to uh, see which capitalist general overthrew the, the next one and why, feel free to go ahead and read it. But what changed everything for uh, were two things that you want to keep in mind. First of all, 1919, uh, our friend, the super agent, arrives, uh, Baroden, arrives in Mexico City, sets up the Peruvian Communist Party, I mean the Mexican Communist Party, with Hero, which is charged into uh, creating uh, communist parties in the rest of Latin America. Now, to understand how, what an electrifying effect Baroda's arrival had on the intellectual left in Latin America, you have to kind of picture it this way. In the, the Russian Revolution was something that these left intellectuals were aware of, but it was almost like uh, it was happening on another planet. All of a sudden, Lenin sends Baroden to uh, Mexico, sets up the Communist Party, gives Jose Allen the job of organizing communist parties in every other country of Latin America. Martin, I mean, Jose Allen takes this very seriously. He uh, probably is thinking of himself in much the same way as in Christian mythology. We have the disciples thinking about their Last Supper with Jesus Christ and having been given the orders to spread Christianity throughout the world. The uh, I, my guess is that, that Jose Allen probably saw himself as something like St. Paul well, would be in that mythology because he really did take this seriously and everywhere in Latin America the intellectual left was flocking because the word was immediately out. The Mexican Communist Party is charged with forming communist parties all over Latin America so that's what's going to happen. So the center of this fight is now in Mexico City. So by 1920, people from all over Latin America had or were flooding into Mexico City to see Jose Allen and see what they had to do to become part of uh, the common term, the Communist International. Well, one of those guys was named Jose Carlos Mariategui. We've mentioned him before and we'll mention him again in this series. He was from Lima, Peru. He, was the, he would become the original Latin American Communist theoretician. Um, he shows up in Mexico City early in 1920, uh, pounding on Jose Allen's door, saying that uh, you know he wants to join the uh, the common turn and he wants his marching orders. Well, Allen says, "Fine, you you know we, we'll make your application here, and in the meantime, I want you to go to Italy, Livorno, Italy next year. That is in 1921 is going to have a founding convention of the." Uh, Communist Party there, 
and this would be a perfect place for you to go because you will you'll be in on the ground floor all the luminaries of the common turn are going to be there and you'll get to meet with them directly <coughs> Lennon won't be there but the other guys are going to be there um, and they're all operating directly as I am under uh, Lennon's orders so Mariotti jumps on a boat he heads over there to uh, Livorno and sure enough in uh, 1921 he's there to attend this conference but he gets there even before the conference is held in 1921 and among other things he uh, meets a woman there an Italian woman he gets married he goes to the conference he gets his first informal indoctrination into Marxism-Leninism finds out what it's all about turns around and comes back with his new wife and what he calls a smattering of Marxism that he's learned there in Italy to uh, Lima and uh, in Lima, he has a, he begins to give a, a series of art, write a series of articles in a local newspaper there, uh, which are now uh, collected under the title "Figures and Aspects of International Life," and uh, also writes his seven essays, which is an important theoretical contribution to uh, Marxism based upon his analysis of. Uh, the ethnography, that is the living, pe living primitive peoples of Peru. Well, at the same time that this is going on, another Peruvian named Victor Raul Aya de la Torre has gone to Mexico City and he has formed there, because he's been kicked out of Peru, he has formed there a, a group called APRA, OPERA, um, and the uh, what opera turns out to be is a typical um, second international type of party, a labor faker operation totally, um, run by uh, Aya de la Torre personally for his own benefit and a small, smaller group of black, uh, similarly situated petty bourgeois Peruvians who have adopted some left phraseology so that they've been able to put together a certain amount of following in the slums of Peru, and Trujillo, and Arequipa among people that are either workers or would like to be workers or are poor peasants that have been forced off the land and into the city. Um, at first, the uh, Mariachi uh, uh, tries to get along with this uh, Aprista operation, but eventually that comes to an end. And in 1928, uh, they're split between the communists in Peru and uh, I, uh, and opera is uh, finalized. Now, I might say that uh, I had some personal insight into all of this because uh, when I was in prison down there in Lima, uh, a place called Lurigancho Center for Social Readaptation, which was the only part of the previous over uh, the previous administration that was uh, still there. What it was, um, th there had been an earlier attempt uh, under uh, the uh, Velasco leadership um, uh, to um, make uh, some prison reforms, but unfortunately the only part of that prison reform that had lasted after Velasco was overthrown and murdered um, on the orders of the CIA by uh, uh, in a Peruvian naval hospital in Lima after that was over, about the only thing that was left of his prison reform program was the name Center for Social Readaptation. But with that as an introduction, let me say that in uh, 1979 and 1980, there was a campaign to create a constituent assembly in Peru. This was an attempt of the military dictatorship that had thrown me in jail uh, to put on some kind of democratic facade. And in this, it was, of course, being assisted by the U.S. Embassy, which and that's, at that time ran, called all the shots in Peru, as they had been since they had assassinated Velasco. And the, the president of Peru at that time was a, a general named uh, Morales Bermudez. Morales Bermudez <laughs> was such a character that he used to force the TV stations to put him on the air when he'd get good and drunk and feel like it, and it, he would sit there and drink and, and do cocaine on TV in front of the cameras until he passed out. Well, that's 
that's the kind of president they had <laughs> at the moment. What they were trying to do was to get to clean up their image, which obviously needed it, and put some somebody in office that would uh, have some kind of claim to legitimacy. So there were a number of people running for the presidency of the Constituent Assembly, and one of them was uh, Victor Raul Aya de la Torre, a guy who had been around forever. I said, remember, he started out in 1924, and here we are in 1979-1980. So he came out to Lurigancho to meet with some of us because I wasn't the only high-profile prisoner out there. There were a number of us. And um, so he didn't come out to see me, I'm sure of that, but he came out to see some of the others and to get their support. So I, I listened to the pitch that he had to make. And I'll just say one more thing. I talk about that a little bit in the book, but you can imagine that this was just the same kind of nonsense that you get up here. Whenever they get in real trouble, they'll get somebody like Obama to come out and tell you everything you want to hear. And uh, sure enough, the, uh, those that are susceptible to being fooled again and again and again will go right in there and do it. So that's that was his role. There was another guy that came out to see us named Hugo Blanco. Uh, he was running on a left wing, what he would consider to be a communist program, but he was a well-known Trotskyist. But he was a little bit different than the other Trots in that he had actually done something. He had led an armed rebellion up in the Andes, and um, at that point he had come back down to participate in this uh, electoral process. And uh, I remember I, I got a chance to ask him a couple of questions, and if we get to that point, uh, we'll talk about it. At any rate, uh, in, uh, in the case of Mariotti, when he split back in 1928 completely with the opera and the Peruvian Communist Party uh, was formed in 1930. Now, how did that come about? Well, originally, uh, a common turn executive came to see a name. His name was Eudocio Ravines, and he came to see Mariotti in Lima early in 1929. And he said, uh, you know, he was happy about the fact that they had gotten it together and made a formal split for the right reasons with the Apristas, and he wanted to invite Mariotti and whoever he thought uh, which should come with him to uh, two meetings in the next year, 1930. Now, one of those meetings was the formation of the Latin American Trade Union Congress. The other was the first common turn Congress to be held in Latin America itself, which would be short. That first one was going to be in Montevideo, which is the capital of Uruguay, and the second one was going to be in Buenos Aires. And Mariotti said, yeah, well, yeah, I'll be happy to come. Well, as it turned out, Mariotti's medical condition got worse. He was suffering from osteomyelitis. Um, in modern times, what he had would have been easily cured with antibiotics, but we're well, this is a long time before the invention of antibiotics. So what happened was he, first of all, wasn't able to go, and he designated two people, a man named Hugo Pese and another named Julio Porto Carrero, to go for Peru to this conference in Uruguay and the other conference in Buenos Aires. And he died in early 1931. Uh, no, early 1930. So <clears throat> he died in April of 1930, but the other two fellows, they, they were all, already picked up and they were ready to go and they continued. So Mariotti, as with all of the potential he had as a leader and a theoretician, was removed at a fairly early age for by this uh, osteomyelitis that he suffered from. And he'd had one leg amputated in December and finally died in April of 1930. Hugo Pese, one of these two young men that uh, now becomes a, uh, the, the Communist Party of, of Bolivia is going to be formally created this year, 1930. One of those guys who form it will be Hugo Pese. But the reason I'm mentioning him specifically, where I don't mention so many names in these audio lectures, is because when Che Guevara would show up in Lima a couple of decades later, it's a uh, 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 Pese that takes him under his wing, or a decade later, I guess it would have been, wouldn't it? No, two decades later, that's right. At any rate, 
Hesse is a medical doctor by that time. He identifies with Che Guevara, who's finished medical school. He just hasn't taken the time to finish his licensing uh, in Argent in, back home in Argentina, and he'll do that uh, in another year. But at this time, he's taken under the wing of Hugo Hesse, who teaches his, him his first formal Marxism. That is the kind of thing you're getting in these lectures if you start with lecture one. And the other one is uh, Julio Porto Carrero, the other leader that goes to these two meetings in Montevideo and Buenos Aires. And he, he is a young worker who leads uh, in a major textile plant in Lima. And uh, he's elected to the executive board of this Latin American Trade Union Confederation in Montevideo when he goes there, which is uh, CSLA in the English letters. Um, you know, I won't even bother going through the Spanish. Those of you who are interested, you'll have it all in your book. At any rate, uh, the Communist Party of Peru was formed the following month. That is, um, Mariátegui died in April, and in May of 1930, the Communist Party of Peru was reformed and brought into the common turn, and that occurs in 1930. Now, here's where I, I said we might mention what one of the questions I asked Hugo Blanco when he came out to visit us in Lurigancho was to what degree is there any validity to the idea that it's been propagated by Trotskyists here and there that uh, Mariatiki was on the verge of joining with them in the uh, Stalin-Trotsky split. And uh, I had a certain amount of respect for Hugo Blanco because he had done what Trots rarely do, which is to do anything. And he had uh, started an armed struggle, and he'd had a, he hadn't won it, but he would at least had fought some fought government troops up there in the Andes, so that was something. And he'd survived it, which is always important. What he told me was, um, he said, "There's no evidence that he is aware of to support the idea that Mariátegui was ever anything other than a Stalinist." Quote unquote. That was his term, not mine. And. Uh, he, he said this at the same time that he said, he, yes, he did agree with Mariotti's seven theses, uh, or seven essays. And we'll, we'll talk, uh, we're going to talk more about these seven essays when we get to the chapter 35 on the fight for communism in Peru proper. But at any rate, that kind of convinced me that what I thought was the case was the case, because Hugo Blanco was the only Peruvian Trotskyist I had any respect for, and if he said there's no evidence for the idea that Mariátegui was anything other than a Stalinist, which is a trot term for anybody that follows the party line coming out of Moscow, um, then uh, I'll take his word for it. That, that certainly was my idea. Well, okay, so what happened back in Bolivia after all of this? After 1930 and before 1940, there was what was called the Revolutionary Left Party, um, another communist party in Bolivia. Now, it was in many ways a kind of front organization for the Communist Party of Bolivia itself. Now, with a somewhat broader appeal, it was sympathetic to the Communist International, but it didn't try to get in. Why? Well, the Peruvian communists were already in the common turn. What they needed was a party with essentially the same pitch, but uh, which was not a, an affiliate of the common term. So the PIR went to work doing the kind of work uh, that it should be doing if it was going to be working with the Bolivian, with the uh, Bolivian Communist Party's party uh, work uh, program, and it um, so it was got into the mining. Now, mining is a, a, a tricking thing, tricky thing in Peru because and Bolivia, because the, uh, these mines are so high that white men and black men can't work there. Only Indians can have the hemoglobin and the lung capacity to work at those high altitudes. So the PIR went in to do the party's work inside the, uh, b the mines of Peru and Bolivia, and uh, it lasted up until about 1940. Uh, before it was able to do anything. Now, in opposition to that was the Trotskyist Party, which was called POR, a Revolutionary Workers' Party in English, and um, it had no problem in working 
for strikes during the war. Now, this was a problem for the PIR, which was just a front organization for the uh, Bolivian Communist Party, and uh, because communists in all over the world, but especially in Latin America, were supposed to stop strikes that might affect the English-speaking country's war efforts. And they did. Well, it's a hard line to sell to miners up there in the Andes to tell them, look, I know you're getting screwed in hours, wages, working conditions, and that, but, that, but we can't do anything about that right now because more important than your situation is the situation of, of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union's allies uh, uh, are the ones that own these mines, and we cannot have a strike here. So the Trots, of course, didn't have that problem. They could say, fuck the goddamn Russians. We will um, we'll organize this whole thing, and we'll get you what you deserve in terms of hours, wages, and working conditions. Right. The other, the other party which was in opposition to the Bolivian Communists was called the Revolutionary Nationalist Movement, MNR, which was a left labor faker operation like the uh, Peruvian opera, but we're in Bolivia now. Okay, so this MNR seized power by armed force in April 9, 1952, and uh, in La Paz by, with mine workers. So the first guy that they elected um, following that armed seizure of power as their president was named Victor Paz Estensoro. This guy is going to be important right up to the advent of Evo Morales. He'll be in and out, in and out. Now the MNR formed a government supported therefore by mine workers and Indian farmers and middle class mestizos initially. And, um, but once in power, uh, they began to follow an IMF kind of program, and which is austerity for the workers and the farmers and free gifts of money for the bankers and the capitalists. Uh, in 1964, Paz Estensoro would run for and win re-election again, only to be to deposed by a military coup. Now, by 1964, the U.S. Embassy was openly running just about everything in Peru. Now, they and the Peruvian and Bolivian army were very concerned about Che Guevara. And so they were trying to figure out how some way to catch him and destroy his organization. And as you probably know or you'll remember, they succeeded in that in 1967. Well, all right. Now, going back to 1950, that is the period after the Second World War was over and the first five years of the post-war period where the Truman Doctrine is now spreading throughout all of Latin America, which is the U.S. embassies have all been instructed to destroy every vestige of progressive government that existed as a consequence of the Soviet alliance period in the, 19, uh, the period 1941 to 1945. And uh, in 1950, a section of the PIR uh, membership broke away and refounded the Communist Party of Bolivia. Uh, and by the 1960s, the PCB had to a large extent replace the PIR altogether. I'll just bring you up to speed on that. I take more time in the text, but the PIR actually just kind of went, 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 away, went away and disintegrated. Many years later, it would come back as a resurrected name uh, under the uh, form of an alliance with a dictator named Banser. But when the Communist Party of Bolivia was formed, it reformed in 1950, as a breakaway from the PIR. They took all the people worth having, all of the good people, and um, the rump PIR just declined and disappeared altogether. 1979, as I say, they would come back for a brief period of time. So uh, the, 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 the army got, ruled Bolivia from 1964 until 1982, and there, so there was a prolonged period of military rule and a successive bunch of military governments. I'm not going to go into which general replaced which which time period. It's in your book, but it's a, uh, an 18-year long period of essential stagnation where the different factions within the army are fighting for, uh, it's a dogfight, for whatever they can get in terms of the economy. Well, two things happen in that period of time. They succeed in murdering Che Guevara, 
if you want to see a movie about it, there's to me it's kind of a depressing movie, but on the other hand, it's, it's very good called uh, Che Part Two, where you can see how Che came back from Africa to Cuba, adopted a, a disguise that was so good that he was able to spend his last dinner with his children and they didn't recognize him. So they show that in the movie. So with that cover he flew into Bolivia and then rapidly went into the countryside and he, and he started what happened, the, the, the war there. And But he was captured and murdered after he was captured in October 67. The other thing that happens that's very important in that period of time is that uh, the military juntas that have been coming to power and being overthrown one after the other um, uh, continued until the 1970s when they were dominated by a guy named General Banzer. Hugo Banzer was president from 71 to 78. Now during his first few years he had a populist kind of pitch to people and he, he got a certain amount of support primarily because for the moment the Bolivian economy was being driven and it was there was a lot of money flowing into the pockets of workers that worked in the mines uh, because commodity exports of tin uh, for example were way up. Now that of course couldn't last and uh, Banzer was forced to resign in 1978 by the army and it dropped all pretenses of uh, democratic facade and uh, established martial law and they ran the country that way uh, until 1980. Well, Banzer announced that since the army was going to allow presidential elections again, he would run again in 1980, and uh, two other groups decided that they would run at the same time. Um, but the situation for the economy was not getting any better, and um, these, of course the IMF was they're doing the same thing then that they try to do today to the Ukraine and to Eastern Europe and everybody else, which is have a program of complete austerity for the masses of people that actually work and a program of complete giveaway of endless amounts of cash to the owners of the banks and the big, and the big companies. So that was bound to lead to a reaction, and it did. So that in Peru and Bolivia, now we're talking about Bolivia first of all, uh, we have this IMF program being imposed on the country and um, so for the fourth time since 1952 Paz Estensoro wins the uh, elections. Now abandoning his left-wing allies and his own populist past, Estensoro decreed one of the worst IMF economic stabilization packages ever to be implemented anywhere in Latin America. He called it the New Economic Policy, Nueva Política Económica, or NEPA. The decree aimed at ending Bolivia's record-setting hyperinflation, but he proceeded to dismantle many of the government state enterprises that had been created earlier by the revolution. And although successful in ending hyperinflation, this new economic program also brought about a sharp reduction, of course, in the real wages for workers and it temporarily increased the country's already high levels of poverty. So Paz Estensor and Banzer negotiated a formal power-sharing agreement, which they called the Pact for Democracy. Well, during the 1989 and 1993 presidential elections, the uh, Pact played an important part. But this was really just like a, a Republican-Democrat coalition in Congress. Uh, just two wings of the same party. So there was bound to be trouble over this and um, in 1993 the, uh, the government again uh, collapsed. A new government led by a temporary man named Sanchez de los Sala was uh, placed in power. In our last lecture on Bolivia I think I talked a little bit about how by this time Hugo Morales has, is leading a mass movement of cocaleros, that is coca leaf growers as well as a broader mass movement of poor people in general. And uh, so at this particular time, uh, Morales is now going to have to combine, uh, confront Lozada. Well, the umpteenth betrayal 
occurs in 1997 ele elections when Hugo Banser was returned to the presidency. And Banser, instead of doing what he said he was going to do, he did exactly the opposite, proved that he was a good Obama type. He um, immediately turned the whole thing over to the IMF and made the critical part of attacking the coca workers union because the one thing Abel Morales had going for him was that his Indians had an indigenous crop which was very important to them, a very important cash crop which was opposed by the United States government and that was the coca leaf crop. Now we went through all of that in the last lecture and I won't do it again except to say that now the time has come and the people of Bolivia said we've had enough of Banser and the rest of this democratic pact crap and we're going to uh, uh, rise up and do something about it. So they did. And to make a long story short, what uh, came out of that was uh, the decision to, they, br they, they brought in a man in May of, 19, of 2005 uh, named uh, Mesa, M-E-S-A. And uh, President Mesa, uh, he made a, a whole bunch of promises. But as soon as he got into office, it turns out that he recognized that this is my last chance to get a retirement package and head for the French Riviera. So he did exactly the opposite. He, <laughs> he did a complete Obama 180 degree turn and did exactly the, everything that he said he wouldn't do. Well, that of course led to another popular uprising. The coca workers are especially mad because what all of this means to them is that these dictators have told the American government that well, yeah, it's your people that create this huge market for our product, but we'll help you and we'll, uh, we'll take it over and suppress it. So their idea of a cleanup program is for the Army to go in and take the place of the old traffickers. And uh, the Army loves to do that because now they're making the money. The generals, who before would have, might have had to live on their salaries plus whatever they could shake down in a few neighborhoods, now have got millions of dollars of uh, coca money coming into their pockets. And so they're going to keep the cocaine business for themselves as long as they can. Well, that isn't going to last very long. In the December 25, 2005 elections, there was a solid victory for the people's leader, Evo Morales, and his movement toward socialism, MAISA. And Morales campaigned as an opponent of the Army's front coca eradication program. In other words, calling it exactly what it was. The only, the only coca eradication that's going on here is coca that's not in the hands of the army men themselves. So we're going to put an end to all of that. So the election marked the beginning of the increased polarization between the supporters of Morales, uh, largely of indigenous poor descent, and the inhabitants of Bolivia's western highlands, that is the rich white fascist opponents of European descent, who had inhabited the eastern lowlands. All right, having gone through that much, let me uh, now just go back to this situation with, uh, we talked a little bit about the Bolivian communists. We went on up through um, the um, struggle they'd had with the Trotskyists there, how the Trots had broken away and gotten a union base uh, during the war because they were the only ones that would uh, take on an active strike policy. Um, what that did in the long run, of course, was to set them up to be uh, a target of a, a communist counterattack after the war was over. Well, at this particular point, I think we've probably gone as far as I want to go with this lecture, and uh, we're going to stop here, and then next time around we're going to switch over to Peru proper and show how that end of the Mariategui Communist Party movement uh, developed.